Hello and welcome to the Central Now. I am Likon on Mabanjo, the top stories at this hour. President Tinumbu signs executive order removing tariffs, excise duties and VAT on imported pharmaceutical inputs. Togo implements COVID screening tests for returning pilgrims. Citizens votes with incumbent El Ghazwani tipped to win in Mauritania election. Details to come away shortly. Let's begin by telling you that President Bola Tinumbu has signed an executive order removing tariffs, excise duties and value-added taxes on imported pharmaceutical inputs. This includes machinery, equipment and raw materials from pharmaceutical production. This was revealed in a statement by the Health and Social Welfare Minister, Mohamed Ali Pate. Pate highlighted that this move aims to boost local healthcare production and manufacturing, such as pharmaceuticals, diagnostics and medical textiles. Justice Minister Latif Olasukomi Fadbemi, while will codify the order, crucial for the Healthcare Value Chain Initiative approved in October 2023. Items covered include active pharmaceutical ingredients, excipients and other essential raw materials for drugs and medical products. The order also establishes market mechanisms to support local manufacturers and mandates collaboration among various ministries and agencies to ensure smooth implementation. When I'll tell you that former President Golok Jonathan has expressed optimism about overcoming Nigeria's socio-economic challenges. He was speaking in Yanagwa at the Nigerian Bar Association Yanagwa Law Week 2024, themed the legal profession in a time of socio-economic uncertainty. Jonathan, represented by King Collins Daniel, praised the government's efforts to address the issues. He commended the NBA Yanagwa, led by Sumina John Bull, for organizing the event and selecting a timely theme. Jonathan noted that economic hardships affect all sectors, not just the legal profession, and called for collaborative solutions. He also highlighted past economic challenges such as those during the 1929-1930 to Depression and the 1984-1987 to Structural Adjustment Program, emphasizing the importance of resilience and collective effort in overcoming such difficulties. Away from that budget, a civic tech organization has condemned the federal government's plan to implement four national budgets concurrently. On June 27, the National Assembly extended the capital component of the 2023 Appropriation Act and its supplementary budgets overlapping with the 2024 budget. President Bola Tinumbu is expected to submit the 2024 supplementary budget soon, resulting in four budgets running in 2024. Budgets Country Director Gabriel Okewu called this a worrisome development, noting that budgets worldwide typically run for 12 months. Budgets warn that concurrent budgets would lead to competition for scarce resources and negatively impact essential projects and service delivery. It also urged the government to return to a disciplined January to December budget calendar. Now, in the meantime, the presidency has clarified that the 2023 budget extension ensures full project execution following criticism by civic tech organization budgets. The National Assembly approved President Bola Tinumbu's request to extend the capital component of the 21.83 trillion Naira 2023 Appropriation Act and the 2.1 trillion Naira 2023 Supplementary Appropriation Act until December 31, 2024. This means the capital allocations for 2023 and 2024 will run concurrently. Presidential advisor Bayo Ononuga explained that this decision addresses funding delays that prevented project execution. The extension allows for the completion of these projects, such as those on the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security. Earlier, senior researcher and policy analyst Budget Foundation Vayala Kwaga unpacked this on the news. Of this current administration to, as it were, stretch the implementation dates of certain capital expenditures is not necessarily unusual. The previous administration had done so, I think, uh, once or twice. I recall that one of Buhari's budgets, if I'm not mistaken, the 2022 fiscal year, 
had certain things spill into 2023. And 2021, I, I recall as well, had certain components that brought into 2022. I think they were extended to about March of 2022. So it is not uh, unusual to have maybe one or two aspects of capital, uh, the capital budget being brought into the next fiscal year. As a matter of fact, the issue of the principle of budget annuality, now that's a principle of good budgeting that ensures that budgets do not go beyond one fiscal year. They are not extended beyond 12 calendar months, whether your calendar month is from March of this year to February of the next year, or from June of this year to May of the next year, I think as the United States tends to do, as long as you keep it within 12 months, there really isn't much of a problem. Now we tell you that Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima has asked Nigerians to be fair in their assessment of President Bola Tinumbu's leadership. The Vice President said this at a one-day town hall meeting organized by the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council held at the Banquet Hall of the State House in Abuja. He said the current economic challenges in the country are not the making of the president, but a global phenomenon. Describing President Tinumbu as a man of ideas robustly built with leadership capacity, Shetima believes the country has never been blessed with leadership like now and urged Nigerians to support him. And now to discuss this, I am joined by a public affairs analyst, Kabiru Sufi. Kabiru Sufi, it's nice to have you on the news. Program. Yes, so first, let me get your fair and honest assessment of President Bolatinumu's administration and, um, and, of course, our leadership style. Uh, well, um, one can say that uh, from the beginning, um, uh, the, the president hit the ground running and showed that it is going to be uh, a full implementation of uh, liberal economic policies. Uh, with his pronouncement of the withdrawal of the subsidy, uh, I mean, uh, after inauguration. Uh, so um, then the people, of course, uh, had very high hope that um, uh, th there was going to be a change of leadership style. Uh, and especially people uh, uh, thought that uh, this is a man that can assemble a great team uh, that can be able to uh, uh, push Nigeria forward. Uh, this was uh, from the onset the, the impression people had. Uh, of this administration. Uh, so that pronouncement, of course, um, Nigerians uh, didn't know what to expect, uh, especially with the withdrawal of the subsidy. Uh, but then a number of other economic policies uh, were combined with the withdrawal of the full subsidy, I mean, uh, uh, brought uh, some economic hardships uh, on, on Nigerians. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and that is where the complaint is, uh, that um, uh, there are, the, the, the economic hardships are are increasing by the day. Uh, this is where there are complaints. And of course, um, uh, so it goes beyond uh, assembling a team. And of course, uh, it goes beyond uh, uh, rolling out um, many economic policies at the same time, uh, which the people uh, couldn't understand, uh, especially with the so hardships associated with those uh, economic policies. Uh, OK, so you talked about um, the president uh, hitting the ground running. And of course, um, the vice president, Shitima, also said the president is working hard to make the country great. But um, economic challenges have been a pullback on his efforts. But this, the, questions, uh, the question Nigerians are asking right now is, the economic hardship was brought about by who and what? Because they said that they didn't have it this bad before now. Yeah, of course, uh, the Nigerians would have to ask these questions. Um, uh, when you say by who, uh, we can rightly say that uh, those policies uh, partly were responsible for uh, the, the increase in the economic hardship. Uh, for example, withdrawal of full subsidy. Definitely, it will send the I mean, uh, tr transportation cost uh, high. And uh, especially, that will now be uh, sent back to the consumers. So definitely, when they ask by who, I think um, uh, Nigerians are right asking that question. Uh, very recently, withdrawal of a subsidy on electricity, electric consumption, that also, uh, you can see, has sent uh, uh, locally manufactured goods. I mean, the prices of locally manufactured goods, I mean, I mean uh, increasing by the day. So, so I, I think um, Nigerians have the right to ask by who. Um, but uh, the vice president was right to have said that um, 
uh, uh, part of the economic hardship isn't only a Nigerian thing. Uh, when you look at what uh, is happening, uh, for example, in Kenya, and of course it's a global thing one, one can say, but uh, Nigerians, like you rightly said, have never had it this bad, so Nigerians have the right to ask questions. And I think it is now the responsibility of the government to uh, always uh, uh, take a fair assessment of those policies and see how uh, they can uh, bring support to Nigerians and how those hardships can be relieved. I mean, uh, and how prices of goods, ordinary Nigerians care about the prices of goods and how that those, of course, can be brought down. Uh, you've actually mentioned um, a few of the policies of government, um, Sufi, and how it has impacted Nigerians. Uh, but then if you say that um, the vice president has been apt in his um, statement saying that Nigerians should actually appreciate what um, the president has done so far, what policies would you say, uh, aside, of course, the um, removal of fuel subsidy, the harmonization of um, the foreign exchange, what policies would you say have been put in place by government that actually speaks or addresses the plights of Nigerians? Or would you, or let me just put it this way, what policies would you say Nigerians have benefited from that you feel they can smile about in the last one year? Well, well, I think um, the, the government is uh, beating its chest about uh, uh, maybe trying to make the country attractive for foreign investment. Um, but I think uh, that is something that will take a very long time for Nigerians to see. And it, it is at that same time that we see uh, some foreign companies folding up. And it is likely maybe due to the challenges that they are facing uh, in the economic environment. Uh, so, of course, uh, there may be some uh, positive steps. The harmonization of, of, of course, of the Naira exchange rate, for example, uh, has is supposed to maybe remove corruption, uh, make uh, for, uh, foreign direct investment uh, attractive to the country. But I, I mean, those things are, are yet to be seen fully on the ground. So, of course, uh, maybe uh, the, the, the policy objectives uh, may be good, but then these are not uh, immediate. Uh, I mean, policies that will give immediate results. So, so I think. Um, the government uh, need to be reviewing these policies from time to time uh, and see. Uh, uh, so sometimes, uh, it, it, no matter how good the intention is, uh, when the policies uh, are not really working due to our environment. So I, I, I believe it is there is always time for us to make a review or a rethink about those policies. Okay, so finally, um, finally, before I let you go, what, what kind of policies now do you think the government should be um, tinkering with? that can actually help in ameliorating um, the situation or the hardship that Nigerians are facing now? Because clearly it seems as though what is on the ground might not really be necessarily meeting the needs of Nigerians and the economy seems not to be smiling at this time. Well, I think um, two policies uh, need to be reviewed. I don't know how the government is going to do that. I mean, the, the hike in the tariff of electricity, I mean, that is, uh, is, is something that they need to check because that is sending the prices of uh, uh, Nigerian manufactured goods, uh, I mean, uh, very high. Prices are skyrocketing uh, very recently, and they are not associated with, of course, the, the, the incre increase in the dollar rates. No, this is, this is something that has to do with the, the hike in the tariff of electricity. That is number one. And number two, withdrawal of the fuel subsidy itself, uh, I mean, what have we in, in, on, in ground to, to have, uh, I mean, ameliorate the, the sufferings that Nigerians are facing? I mean, the, 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 the transportation cost has more than quadrupled, I mean, in the, in the last 12 months. So what is the government putting in place? I mean, there should be uh, something that, that will uh, bring down these prices. I mean, the CNG initiative uh, is not quickly being rolled out. So the government should, should and then... The, the, the Nangote refinery that we are seeing that Nigerians are having hope that uh, maybe Nigerian refined petroleum products uh, will flood the market and will probably, because of market dynamics, bring down the prices of goods and services. We are yet to see that because uh, the refinery itself is, is, is uh, explaining to Nigerians that it is having challenges accessing Nigerian crude. So, so I think um, it, it means that whole policy needed, need a rethink. I mean, so if these two, for example, can be tackled, uh, I mean, immediately, then probably we might see uh, some support in, in, in uh, what the experiences of Nigerians with regard to the economic hardship. And then uh, we can take a holistic approach and then look at other policies 
are those implemented, are those that are yet to be implemented, and see how, I mean, we can alleviate the sufferings of Nigerians. Mm, Kabir Sufi, Public Affairs Analyst, thank you so much for your time on the news. Thank you for having me. A break we'll do here on the news. We'll be back in a bit to stay with us. Many thanks for being there. We tell you that the Central Bank of Nigeria has announced new guidelines for depositing foreign currency notes. The directive was detailed in a circular issued by the Director of Currency Operations, Mohamed Sholaja, and posted on the bank's website on Friday. From now on, banks can deposit excess foreign currency with the Apex Bank, but there are some rules to follow. The maximum deposit allowed is $10 million per day for $100 and $50 notes and $1 million per day for smaller denominations like $20 notes. Deposits can only be made at CBN branches in Abuja and Lagos. A handling fee of 0.30% will be charged to the bank's account with the CBN. The move aims to deepen the foreign exchange market, boost liquidity and align exchange rates in the official and parallel markets. To tackle the pressing issue of child marriage in northern Nigeria, experts and traditional leaders from Borno, Adamawa and Yobe states have emphasized the critical need for sensitization and increased investment in education and skills training for adolescent girls. These points were highlighted during an engagement organized by the El Kanemi Memorial Foundation and funded by the United Nations Population Fund in Meduguri. New Central's Marikurawa has the report. In northern Nigeria, the disturbing practice of early child marriages remains deeply rooted in cultural norms and economic pressures. For many young girls, marrying before puberty abruptly ends their education and exposes them to severe health risks. A child is defined by the child protection law of Borno State, that of Yobe State and uh, Adamawa State as a person below the age of 18 years. So this is the provision of the laws on the definition of a child. And on child marriage, the laws are generally silent as to uh, the punishment or uh, uh, making child marriage an offense. The law is silent on that. However, we feel that uh, uh, engaging traditional rulers, engaging religious leaders, making them appreciate that uh, letting girl child get educated, letting girl child uh, know that uh, she is now ready to be a mother is, a, is an important investment. The origin uh, is religious. The Prophet وسلم, married Umbuna Aisha radiallahu anha at the age of nine. But out of all his wives, about 13 wives, this is exceptional. It is not his normal um, behavior to marry nine-year-old. Um, and all what the prophet uh, did, you see, is not for everybody to copy. For example, he is allowed to marry more than four wives, you see? And so the prophet did, so I'm going to do no. You see? So there were circumstances surrounding his marriage of Umuna Aisha, nine year old. You see? So that's why even Kudama, you see in his book, um, said, yes, we can marry nine, but there should be no consummation. Youth groups, religious and traditional leaders, among other stakeholders from Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe State, I've been engaged on how best to tackle child marriage. So I'm really calling on the National Bureau for Statistics to carry out a survey to come up with a modality on how to ensure that all these indices that are missing need to be measured to determine that we have a yardstick of measuring our successes and our challenges. Okay, when you marry them off and take them to another man's house, she's not fully grown. She will start giving birth to other children. She is not empowered. Now the children would also be born into poverty because their mother is not educated. She's not empowered. We have a lot of young girls dying while delivering because of the marriage. Maybe they get married at the age they're not supposed to. 
And you know, uh, the pelvic, maybe the pelvic is not wide open, which they are not supposed to get married at that age. The activists and civil society groups are rallying for community awareness to protect vulnerable children from this harmful practice. El Kanami Memorial Foundation decided to uh, uh, train uh, ward heads. We started with ward heads and as well the UN agency and other partners have joined the, 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 the call. So uh, Alhamdulillah we are so glad to make sure that uh, we are so glad to see that and then we will make sure that we take action in that aspect. Tackling child marriage and investing in the education and economic empowerment of adolescent girls can pave the way for a brighter future for young women in Northeast Nigeria. In Maiduguri for News Central, Umuru Kirawa. And elsewhere, the governor of Delta State, Sheriff Oboyawari, has charged youths in the country to acquire skills and financial literacy that would enable them to become self-employed instead of searching for white-collar jobs. Governor Oboyawari gave the charge at the Nanja Delta Viewpoint Small Medium Enterprises called NDVP SME Conference 2024, represented by its Chief of Staff, Johnson Arijo. Governor Boriwari said acquisition of skills in various fields was a sure avenue for self-development and empowerment. With your finances. The time has come to wean our people, especially the youth, from sole dependence on government for the provision of all human capital development mechanisms especially through white-collar jobs. The government alone cannot employ everybody. It has therefore become necessary to train our people in various areas where they can become entrepreneurs, grow their businesses, and become employers. We talk politics now. Nigeria's Independence National Electoral Commission has cleared the air over the tenure of local government chairman nationwide, saying the Electoral Act as amended 2022 now makes provision for a four-year tenure instead of three, as stipulated in the old Electoral Act. The chairman of the commission, while meeting with members of the Inter-Party Advisory Council in Abuja over controversy surrounding area council polls in Abuja, says that only after swearing in can salaries be drawn by the elected officials. In the exercise of its powers as the lawmaking body for the Federal Capital Territory, the National Assembly extended the tenure of the area councils from three to four years, thereby aligning it with executive and legislative elections nationwide. This is one of the important provisions of the Electoral Act 2022. The Act came into force on Friday, 25th February 2022, two weeks after the last area council elections in the FCT. For the avoidance of doubt, tenure is not defined by the date of election, but the date of the off of office for executive elections or the date of inauguration for legislative houses. For the executive, the tenure belongs to the elected individual, while for legislators, the tenure belongs to the legislature. A president, vice president elect, governor, deputy governor elect, senator elect, member elect, chairman elect, or council, councillor elect cannot start exercising the powers of office and drawing from the remunerations attached to it until such a person is sworn in or the legislative house. About securing people's lives, a four-day security summit aimed at tackling emerging security challenges facing the African continent and being hosted by the International Association of Women Police Officers is expected to begin on July 2. The conference, which is being hosted by female police officers, will hold in Abuja and host an array of female officers from over 50 African countries and will spotlight issues of inclusivity and effective collaboration. Marvelous Obomano attended the pre-summit press conference and gives us an insight into the expectations. 
the conference with the theme Addressing Africa's Security Challenges and Safety Through Collaboration and Inclusivity We feature both female police officers and law enforcement officers from across 54 countries in Africa. The Nigerian Police Force Gender Advisor in a pre-summit press conference in Abuja gave more details of the event, which will hold between the 2nd and 5th of July. She says that a conference will host an array of seasoned security experts from across Africa and the international community to help analyze critical security issues confronting the continent in order to chart a way forward. The IAWP Africa Region Training Conference, which is scheduled, as I said earlier, July 2nd to 5th in Abuja, this underscores the urgent need for collaborative and inclusive approaches to tackle the security challenges facing the African continent. We are expecting participants from the 54 African countries, including other international delegates from other uh, continents. The co-founder of the Africa Women Impact Summit also revealed that a conference will benefit the nation immensely. The people that are coming, that are coming to speak, are security experts. I mean, international security experts that are going to be addressing security challenges. Then, of course, we all know there's a local part of security. There's a whole lot. You believe you me, after this program, you're going to see a lot of changes when it comes to security, uh, security of the country, not just Nigeria, the continent as a whole, because the experts are coming together to put their brains together for the very first time. International women policemen across the continent, they are coming to Nigeria. They need to come and learn what we are doing. There are quite a number of emerging security issues, and women are in the forefront of fighting this. And Nigeria has brought in some innovation, especially in building inclusivity. In the, in the policing system and the idea of community policing, all those things they are coming to learn to see how we are doing it in Nigeria and what we are doing and doing very well. They also add that the event is a proof of President Bola Tinubu's commitment to ensure inclusivity in the nation's security landscape. President Bola Tinubu has done tremendously well in building inclusivity in the security system. Number one, Nigerian police has the first gender advisor. Nigerian police has now a female first secretary, which is something that is very unique. Apart from that, you look at the immigration, the, 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 the controller general of Nigerian immigration service is a woman. So women are taking the forefront and they are doing very well. We all know that security is a collective responsibility. Very important. Everybody, including Arise, New Central, everybody needs a police to guide him or her. And anything that has to do with the police should be of utmost concern. The conference is expected to chart a pathway for effective women participation in law enforcement on the continent. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Obomman. Nigeria is experiencing rapid urbanization as small people migrate from rural areas to cities in search of better opportunities. However, the urban housing supply in Lagos appears to be inadequate to meet the growing demand, resulting in high rents, overcrowding and informal settings. New Central's Bettina Anmeli tells us more in this report. Lagos, Nigeria is a city of contrasts. Amidst its vibrant economy and bustling streets lies a growing crisis, homelessness. For many, the streets have become their home. The rising cost of living and insufficient affordable housing options have forced thousands into homelessness. I'm living under the bridge and I don't have any work doing. Work that I used to do to survive is to carry load for people. God. Never bless me. I never get money. I never get us. I never get even pack us at all. The number of homeless people in Lagos is increasing. Many of them are families with children, elderly, and young people who have nowhere else to go. We cannot deny the fact that there is a population explosion in Lagos, and a lot of people just come in from everywhere. Now, when they come in from every part of Nigeria with night bus, you are not exactly sure. And you can't account for them. You don't know where they are staying. They just hide in crevices and uncompleted buildings here and there. We have the state government particularly has done a lot of things to champion registration, residence registration. 
so that the, you know, state can plan for them. When we know where you are, then we can plan for you. Meanwhile, efforts are being made to develop affordable housing and create programs that address the root causes of homelessness. I have two answers for you. One answer is our population is projected to be 200 million by 2050. It means we're going to double. I mean, we're going to double, right? About 400 million, sorry, we're going to double. It means that no matter how many houses we provide today, it's not going to be enough for tomorrow. Okay? So first, we have to change our orientation. The days of everybody living in mansions are gone. You don't even need it. We need to start going vertical. It means we start building vertical cities. Start building. That, there's a reason why in most, most developed societies, they live in apartments. If you want to live in a mansion, then you go out of the city and go and build in a peri-urban area. There is an urgent need for more shelters, better support systems, and affordable housing options. Every city in Nigeria can afford at least one gated community. Because there are people that live in that place, there are people that work in that place that need housing. So what governments must do is begin to understand that you must attract investors. You can't build these houses. Government, even if government tries, Lagos State is one of those that's tried the most. And how many of the houses have they built? I don't think because has done up 10,000 homes. They can't. They don't have the post to do it. But when you're not going to get private developers to come in, you've got to incentivize them. You've got to make the environment less hostile to them. And you've got, I'm not talking about giving them free land. Nobody, a, a serious developer does not need free land. A serious developer does not need a, 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 a largesse. What they need is an enabling environment and then it's able to deliver. Homelessness in Lagos is a complex issue. But with collective effort and commitment to change, we can build a city where everyone has a place to call home. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Unwili. Fantastic report there from Bettina. Thank you. Now, the non-oil sector has massive potential for economic growth and diversification, an increase in the volume and value of exportable goods and services, and the repatriation of export proceeds will enhance foreign exchange inflow into Nigeria and also assist in stabilizing the value of the Naira. However, the decline in non-oil exports has become worrisome. We, we are on an upward trajectory, trajectory now when it comes to the number of exports which are leaving the country compared to the years before it, 2020, early 2021. However, I think that continuity is very important. And um, like you use the word sustainability is key to ensure that the gains we can continue to maintain and perhaps surpass these gains. Um, ETO has come to stay. Uh, we're here in the industry now because being able to quickly evacuate cargoes that are going to the ports is very important in order to ensure that you are, you are taking benefit of the global market that is out there and the, the global demand for what Nigeria is able to produce. So having in place a system like ETO that ensures that the roads are free, that the ports are able to accept what they, uh, what they have capacity for, and that you control the traffic in such a way that those who need to move can move very quickly, and those who do not need to move do not clog the roads for those who don't need to move, is very key. Well, you can find out more about how Nigeria's non-oil sector has fared and what needs to be done to sustain it by watching Maritime Radar on Saturday at 7 p.m. and a repeat broadcast on Sunday at 1 p.m on news central television coming up on the news m23 rebels take control of key town of kayaboyanga in the congo we'll bring you details of this in our stories in a short while do stay with us The news continues in West Africa, where Togo has become the second West African country to implement COVID screening tests and face masks for pilgrims returning from the annual Muslim Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca. Senegal was the first to implement voluntary tests, suspecting COVID-19 among the 1,300 reported deaths. Togo's government announced on Friday that Hajj pilgrims must undergo compulsory COVID tests, limit contacts, wear masks, watch regularly and avoid large gatherings for 10 days after their return. Saudi Arabia reported 1,301 deaths during the pilgrimage, attended by 1.8 million people in extreme heat. Most pilgrims were unauthorized and walked long distances in direct sunlight. 
About 2,500 Togolese pilgrims attended the Hajj this year, departing in June and returning on special flights between June 29 and July 3. Now in Central Africa, Rwandan-backed M23 rebels in the Democratic Republic of Congo have seized control of the strategic town of Koyoboyanga in the eastern North Kivu province. The town, home to over 60,000 people, is a key pathway to major commercial centers like Butembo and Benin. Eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses report intense fighting between Congolese uh, forces and rebels with thousands of displaced people fleeing to safety. Many are too afraid to move, unsure of where to go. The M23 rebels have promised residents peace, but the situation remains volatile. The UN reports that clashes are causing widespread displacement and humanitarian organizations have suspended operations due to security concerns. In Southern Africa, the mission of the Sadat Panel of Elders Oversight Committee on the Suto Reforms have begun their consultations with key stakeholders. The delegation, which is led by the former president of Tanzania and also the chairman of the Panel of Elders, Dr. Jayapkaya Mshiro Kikwete, came to Lesotho with the aim to get information on the reforms progress. Dr. Kikwete said this first mission in Lesotho is intended to find information about the comprehensive implementation of reforms reports from political leaders, civil society organizations, and everyone involved, including His Majesty King Letsi III and the Prime Minister. Away from Africa, we tell you that U.S. presidential candidate and former president Donald Trump is claiming victory over Thursday's presidential debate against President Joe Biden. Trump told a crowd in Virginia on Friday that Biden's performance was a big victory for him, calling the president's corrupt and incompetent. Meanwhile, Biden acknowledged his own struggles in the debate during a rally in North Carolina, saying he may not be as smooth a speaker as he used to be, but he knows how to tell the truth and get things done. Trump also dismissed suggestions that Democrats might replace Biden on the ticket, saying his polls show Biden performs better than other potential Democratic candidates. Hello, Virginia. Did anybody last night watch a thing called the debate? <laughs> yeah. That was a big one. But as you saw on television last night, we had a big victory against a man that really is looking to destroy our country. He's the worst. He's the most corrupt, the most incompetent president in the history of our country. The question every voter should be asking themselves today is not whether Joe Biden can survive a 90-minute debate performance, but whether America can survive four more years of crooked Joe Biden in the White House. And he was never really at the top of his game. He was never very good. But now he's really not good. Last night was a defeat not only for Biden, but for the entire radical left Democrat Party and the fake news media. Business now, despite a 28% increase in revenue for electricity distribution companies, that's discos in 2023, Nigeria's national power grid continues to struggle with a slow growth rate in incremental supply. The country generates an average of 4,000 megawatts of electricity, a mega resource for its estimated 200 million citizens. New Central's correspondent, uh, Juliet Rowland, compiled this report. Nigeria's electricity power outages and grid collapses, numbering six, were recorded in 2024 alone. This highlights the instability of the national grid. The latest collapse on April 15 saw electricity generation plummet from 2,583.77 MW megawatts to 64.7 megawatts in just an hour. The key challenge um, in Nigeria's power sector value chain is um, liquidity, is cash flow. Um, for a sector that has been privatized for over 10 years now and has historically under-collected, even prior to privatization, um, electricity was seen as a social product um, by the federal government of Nigeria, and thus it has always been heavily subsidized. Um, today, 
um, 10 years plus down the line, you cannot drive improved service delivery for a service that is not being charged its actual cost. While discos have seen a significant revenue increase, consumers are still grappling with estimated billing practices and poor services. Experts attribute the revenue increase to tariff hikes, growth in prepaid metering, and customer base expansion. One of the things from my perspective that we suffer is an old centralized national grid. From my perspective, I believe that if you have put, um, if you have used some a, a machine for a long period of time, and you have invested very little into that system, the best thing to do would be to create smaller subsystems, even if you want to retain what you have at the center. To address the crisis, the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NEC, has imposed sanctions on defaulting customers. However, stakeholders emphasize the need for improved metering and infrastructure investments to increase Nigeria's power generation capacity. I believe it's a matter of ambition right now at the state level. How ambitious is the government at the state level? How, how much do they want to drive or attract investment to their states? Um, Nobody wants to shock the market. Nobody wants to shock the policy, the, the, the polity by jacking up um, tariff rates. However, there has to be a plan at the state level that graduates the transition to a cost-reflective market. Urgent reforms and implementation are necessary for Nigeria to join these top-ranked nations and ensure a more efficient and equitable electricity supply system. In sports, Super Falcons of Nigeria's uh, Paris 2024 Olympic Games group opponents, Japan, has unveiled their official 18 women squad. The squad features Liverpool star Fuka Nagano. Japan are in Group C and begin their campaign versus Spain on Thursday, July 25. The 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup champions will then face Brazil three days later before concluding the group phase against Super Falcons, Nigeria on July 31. Meanwhile, Japan will take on Black Queens of Ghana in a friendly game billed for Saturday, July 13 in Kanazawa, Japan. The friendly is part of Japan's preparation for the upcoming Summer Games. This will be the second time the Super Falcons and Japan will square off at the Olympic Games. Elsewhere, Chelsea have signed 18-year-old Aston Villa forward Omari Kellerman on a six-year contract British media reported that a deal between the two Premier League clubs was worth some £90 million. Kellyman made six first-team appearances for Villa. He joined the Birmingham Club's Youth Academy from Derby County in 2022 and is an England youth international. Villa signed Dutch defender Ian Matson from Chelsea for a reported fee of some £40 million on Friday. The 22-year-old was loaned out of Borussia Dortmund last season. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we take a look at some of our top stories. We told you that President Tinubu has signed an executive order removing tariffs, excise duties and VAT on imported pharmaceutical inputs. And Togo has implemented COVID screening tests for returning pilgrims. We also told you that citizens are voting with incumbent El Ghazwani tipped to win in Mauritania election. Don't forget to send your Arabic news report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. Or you can follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also watch News Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo.